with Idri under the AMD project also. So uh, I'm very happy to be here with uh, uh, to share uh, partly of our research under the project. Yes. Yeah, so uh, well, I'm Firoz Islam. I work with Wakanian University in research in uh, water and food team with uh, Catherine and others. Yeah, today I'm an hydrologist. I work with the different kind of models. Yeah, today we'll talk about uh, yeah a methodology we are trying to set up uh, to identify uh, salinity and others and their impacts. Thank you, and <laughs> let's just start the presentation. I do not know who will be the first. Uh, please. OK, uh, I schedule my presentation will be the uh, first one, so please let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just do it for a while. So do you see my screen now? Yeah, we can see your screen. OK. So I try to manage my time to be like on time in 15 minutes. So um, thank you everyone for being here uh, with uh, us for the presentation. So today I'm going to present with the topic. Um, this one like uh, this is partly under um, the contract, the, the work with the AMD project. So uh, this present is about the land use change in the Mekong River Delta regions. Uh, in Vietnam is under climate impact. So I believe that most of you have already know about the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. It is located in the very southern part of Vietnam with the areas like 40,000 square kilometer and the living of more than like um, 18 million people. So uh, as you may know that the Vietnamese Delta is like uh, referred as the right bulk of Vietnam. So is accounting for 54% uh, of Vietnam total rice cultivation areas, and in the annual, it contribute like more than 55% of the national rice productions. And at this moment, the uh, Vietnamese Mekong Delta have challenged um, a lot. Uh, it, it have a lot of issues under the climate impact. So, um, the uh, firstly, you can see in the picture of the, uh, the the first picture is showing the two historical flooding that occurs in 2000 and 2011. This was to uh, this was considered a the surf uh, flood in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, Man. So can you see my stream now? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, can you see my stream now? We are now looking at teams in your screen. Uh, okay. Yeah. We and could see not... it before. Oh, ah, yeah. okay. Okay, let now me we, show Now we you. see the presentation, but not in presentation mode. Mm -hmm. Can you see it now? Yes. It is back. It is back now. Okay, right. Can I move on? Huh? Take not long. Ah, okay. Yeah, they... Sorry, sorry, I was just. Yeah, they... Ah, sorry. Let me share my screen again. It's OK, please proceed. Yes, it's perfectly legible. Uh, carry on.
You are muted. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think now it's okay right now, right? <laughs> Excellent. Please proceed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And also in um, along the coastal line, we see the extreme uh, starlight intrusion is always happen in the years of uh, 2015 and 2016. And the more recently, uh, starlight intrusions will happen in the year to 2019 and 2020. So in this area. And also like uh, together with that, it's facing with the land subsidence with the hotspot area is about um, uh, of the subsidence is about like 40 to 50 uh, millimeter per year. And also following the uh, projections, uh, if the sea level rise until like 100 centimeter and then around 47 percent of uh, the uh, the Delta will be risked until a uh, light of flooding. So um, in this concept, we have already uh, like divide the Mekong Delta into three uh, arrow ecological sub region. The upstream, uh, like the first zone, is including Anyang and Dong Thap province. Is like um, this area. The first zone is affected by flooding, and um, uh, this area is the key uh, area for the dry productions. And as like the second zone is the coastal uh, area is mostly uh, contaminated with the brackets in shore water. So in these areas, mostly is uh, promoting for uh, to develop the aquaculture and the dry aquaculture rotation system. The third reason is the middle zone is where is like mostly the fresh water, and this area is more suitable for uh, the fruit growing also like dry productions and uh, uh, fresh aquaculture. So um, in this seminar or presentation, I try to review how the land use in the Mekong Delta in a specific of time like in the year 2000 until 2011 and 2020. So on the data, like um, on the map, is were collected from the previous project uh, of our departments, and also the um, land use map in year 2022 is were um, the output from the AMD project. So it's on together we overlaid and we see the land use dynamic in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. Together with that to understand like what is uh, the reasons behind we uh, have also collected uh, a publication, the book or the policy or strategy to see like what is the reason behind the change game. And this is the land new map of the Mekong Delta in three periods of time. The yellow color is still in like uh, the rise um, areas. And like you can see, this is two maps in 2000, 2011 is we collect from the previous project and uh, the land new map in year 2022 is we um, the product from ERI. So in this analysis, we try to see in the spatial and temporal where is where it happened, the land new dynamics, where it's changing, uh, what is about, why is why it's changing by flooding, by solar inducements or the economic impact. And also we try to look for what is the strategy for the sustainable developments. In here, we can see this is the land new map in um, uh, two year, 2000 and 2011. So the light color, uh, the the light yellow is so in uh, the double dry rub and mono dry rub. The dark yellow is so in the triple dry rub, and like um, uh, the blue color is so in the aquaculture uh, and uh, stream dry product. And you can see here. So uh, we see like when visualized, we see a lot of changing. But uh, in uh, we, when we put uh, in. Uh, the JF to check the um, and the change in in the overruns we can see like um, in the Horn Vietnamese Mekong Delta is have about 22 percentages of uh, area that have been changed and the highlight of change is was found in Anyang province like it's about like 10 percent it was converted from the double dry rub to triple dry rub. 
and also we can see it like obviously very clearly it changing in along the King Yang growing it's changing from the mono right up to stream right around like two percent two point eight percent and also like along uh, the cotton lines we see in back wheel shock train is around two percent of area which will change from mono right up to aquaculture so and also we like the same thing we are doing in the year 2011 to 2022 to see the changing and quite similar, we see in this period, second period, it's about 24% of the area will have the land you change. In that, the records also will see in the double write off in this area, like Ang Yang and Dong Tha province, it will continually convert to the triple write off. And in, but in verse, the, um, the stream right in this area in Kamau, it was convert to the aquaculture. And also we found like the significant change from triple right rough to fruit trees also in um, the east of Mekong Delta. And also we found like in Chok Chang, we have changed from the triple right rough to double right rough also here. So um, to understand in each um, sub reason uh, we have uh, we have a device and we uh, in we have checked in each reason and then we can see in the upstream in the first reason so mostly in two periods of time from uh, the first and second periods mostly it's changing from the double dry wrap to triple dry wrap and mostly like um, how could they uh, they plant the dry like triple dry wrap because in this area is building a lot of agriculture infrastructure like you can see this is um, the yellow one the dark yellow is the high dye system it was already built up in this area for triple dry rub and also the low dyes it was already contrast in this area that's why in home of the upstream sub region they could like uh, have planting the triple dry rub and it was convert mostly from double to triple dry rub and in the second uh, reason we can see is like mostly Firstly, like in the first period in the King Yang province, it's very quite specially it's convert from um, the the dark color is so in mono right up to stream right, and then to, until the second period it's very really convert from that stream right to aquaculture. Like mostly it's convert to the aquaculture, and in here we also see that like mostly it's have like stream convert to aquaculture in these areas. So the most highlight is like the aquaculture and stream dry is the most suitable under like uh, uh, to like the suitable farming model to reduce the risk of ground and salinity in this area. In the other hand, for the third reason, so we can see like mostly it's convert from uh, this is the fresh water shown, so it's convert from double to triple dry rub also. And mostly we can see um, in the orange color is convert mostly from uh, triple dry rub or double dry rub to the fruit tree. So the fruit tree is like mainly increasing in the fresh water zone. So uh, in general, we can see uh, in the whole period, we can see very high line. In the upper stream zone, uh, mostly the double dry rub is always convert to the triple dry rub. And in the fresh water zone, the second zone is always convert from even though double or triple dry rub to the fruit tree or radans. Uh, and in the third zone is the short source water uh, zone is always convert like from very beginning is mono dry rub then turn to the stream dry and then it's turned to the aquaculture in uh, most area in this um, this Mekong Delta region. And uh, to understand like, like how it's changing and what's it, uh, the mechanism is um, effect to the changing like it's, uh, it's because not only on the, uh, the water's um, management, uh, the water uh, characteristics, the soil characteristics, and also uh, the policy or the strategy of our government is also plays an important role. So in the year 
we have already listed like the main policy that impact to the land use change in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta, especially like in the year um, 1999, we have also uh, have the master plans for uh, the flood control and also the water use. And in the year 2000, it's also uh, this also like the resolutions in in this year is also emphasize that it's, we need to focus on the uh, right production volume. But until the year like in uh, the year 2013, when we have the Mekong Delta plan is also like it's already shifting the policy plan. Like uh, we complete like trend to work the agro business industrialization to make the uh, very advantages for the Mekong. And I think it's also very high line for the Mekong Delta Agriculture Transformation Program. It starts from the government resolution 120 in uh, the year 2017 and also the following action plan in 2019. And that's like kind of uh, shifting away from target production volume toward the full potential of Delta and we turn to focus on the quality product and value adding functions. So in general, in a period 1999 to uh, 2013, we focus more like Vietnamese Mekong Delta strategy, we focus more on the dry productions, the flood and salinity control project. But from um, 2013 to 2015, the transition to work to increase the value of agriculture project uh, product and efficient um, vision of uh, resource utilizations. And since um, 2016 up to now, the trans um, the transition to work the multi uh, functional agricultural economies, and we are more focused on the adaptation and sustainability. So I think um, that is quite kind of a uh, very short time for me to have like briefly how the uh, land use the dynamics in the Vietnamese Mekong has changed un under the climate impact. So uh, I hope like you can get more understanding on how land use change in the Mekong Delta. And uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Uh, uh, like uh, it can come from so uh, any question and discussions yeah thank you shall we go for any question at this moment or we'll finish Firoz's presentation and then we'll move for the, the question Catherine what's your uh, well, suggestion I, I i see two hands i see also applauding hands so we would like to communicate that to our speaker as well thank you very much for a very interesting presentation uh, i'm requesting um the people with the questions monaranjan and mike please put your question already in the chat so that we can move straight away to the presentation of feroz so that we get all the questions at the time um, and then kind of come back uh, to this very interesting presentation. Um, would that be okay to you, uh, Jahan? Yeah, I think it's the, <laughs> that's fine. Excellent. Okay, Feroz, please go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll try to share my screen. Let's see if I can do it or not. It's always a challenge. Something is coming on my side. Yes, I see slides and I even see them in presentation modus. Please go ahead. Yeah. OK, uh, so I'm uh, Firuz Islam. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the methodology we're trying to develop uh, on uh, identifying global saline hotspots and uh, vulnerable areas to increasing salinity. Uh, with me in this team, we have worked together with Catherine, Dr. Hester, Judith. Uh, yeah, I am an hydrologist. I introduced myself before, uh, but for this presentation, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about salinity and its impact, then followed by what we want to do and how we wanted to do it in methodology, and then discuss our uh, results and analysis a bit and what we want to do in the future. So what's our plan for this year and coming years? 
So uh, we know like salinity and droughts are uh, two most significant threats and challenges for uh, global food security and biodiversity. And uh, salinity is already impacting uh, food production significantly. And we see that almost a billion uh, hectares of land around the world is actually salt affected. And with climate change and uh, sea level rise and anthropogenic changes, it will uh, worsen. The scenario will be worsen a bit more. Uh, so I think what's needed to be done is to see where uh, the hotspots are, which may require more attention. But when identifying the hotspots, depending on uh, saline data, we need to take into account both soil salinity and water salinity. <clears throat> While doing the literature review, uh, we have seen that most of the cases uh, actually takes either of these. So uh, maybe combining would be a nice idea. And it will be nice to see, OK, uh, which are the vulnerable reasons to increasing salinity, meaning like if salinity increases, these areas will be mostly affected. So our objective was to identify these hotspot areas depending on the salinity data that we can get and then try to understand what will be the impact on uh, or potential impact on crop yield and then try to combine different indices uh, to identify the vulnerable locations for increasing salinity. To achieve this, we first collected data on soil salinity and water salinity, made the salinity map and try to identify the saline hotspot areas, locations around the world, uh, depending on these data. Then we combine the indices of uh, weather and climate data and water availability and application data. Uh, we normalize these indices before combining. And uh, with the combination of these indices, we produced vulnerability maps and try to understand, OK, uh, these are the areas vulnerable to increasing salinity. Then combining that with the global cropping pattern, we tried to see, OK, these are the crops are being grown in uh, vulnerable locations, vulnerable to increasing salinity. Then we tried to combine salinity map, global cropping pattern and impact of salinity on crop yield. To see like what will be the potential loss of crop yield. And then combining these two, I don't know if uh, my OK, I need to. Yeah, combining these two, we uh, wanted to see, OK, uh, which crops are least salt tolerant and they are being grown in vulnerable locations and how much crop yield loss are they having potentially. So to do that, we first start with uh, salinity data collection and producing the salinity map and identification of the hotspot areas. So we uh, tried to collect data on soil salinity and water salinity. Uh, of course, you can see like uh, data availability is scarce, uh, but it's the data driven model. So it depends on how much data we have. Uh, so when combining these two, what we see are uh, like uh, regions such as uh, GCC states and uh, coastal regions of Bangladesh or India and uh, both coast of USA and part of Mexico and Southern Europe are actually uh, largely impacted by soil and water salinity. Then we move on to uh, collect data on the indices on weather and climate and uh, water availability and application. Uh, so for weather, we collected like precipitation, temperature, evaporation and coastal flooding data. And uh, for water availability, we tried to collect groundwater depth, soil moisture, irrigation, type of irrigation, is it surface water, groundwater? Or, and uh, change of water availability and come up with the vulnerability map. So we try to collect data uh, when it's available in the literature. If it's not, then we uh, try to collect data on uh, from satellite imagery and analyze this ourselves with the Google Earth engine. I'll go through a bit faster, I guess. And then combining these, uh, we can see we produced a vulnerability map, vulnerability to increasing salinity. What we usually see here uh, is that uh, the GCC states and the areas, arid regions, and uh, where uh, there are like uh, flood irrigation, so surface irrigation, those are actually more vulnerable to uh, increasing salinity. And also the areas which has already high temperature and high evaporation. So then we try to combine this with the global cropping pattern 
and see which crops are being grown actually in vulnerable in these vulnerable locations. And uh, combine salinity map, global cropping pattern, impact of uh, salinity on crop yield to see which will be the cropping yield loss and where are they. So what uh, for this we explored for uh, three crops, so rice, wheat and maize. Among these three, actually wheat is the least uh, uh, most salt tolerant and maize is the least salt tolerant. But when we project that on a uh, on our vulnerability map, uh, what we see is that even though maize is the least salt tolerant, it's being actually uh, cultivated more on most vulnerable areas than wheat. So that's uh, really interesting to see because if the salinity is increasing in these areas, uh, then uh, the production of maize might be more at risk than wheat. Then we try to uh, combine uh, data from uh, FAO, which shows like the impact of salinity, both soil and water, on uh, crop production, and to see how much potential loss there can be uh, uh, globally. So what we see that the maize, as it's the least soil tolerant crop, it will have like uh, most productivity loss. So that's our methodology for next year. We want to improve our methodology and uh, especially we consider the weightages for our indices as equal. So we would like to see how different weightage uh, impacts our analysis. And uh, we would like to use our methodology in more regional cases uh, if data is available and see, uh, try to uh, validate that and adjust our uh, methodology a bit. And uh, for now, we are using uh, data from the past or uh, till now, but uh, we would like to collect for data for the future and see which areas will be most vulnerable in the future as well. Um, yeah, that's about it. But uh, I would like to end with this slide. This was uh, two pictures we took from our field trips in Bangladesh in May when the salinity is the highest. So the green areas are actually uh, in a bit inland and uh, the barren land is a bit south. So it's the pictures of two areas not that far from each other uh, at the same time. Uh, it shows like due to increasing salinity, actually already some coastal regions are being adversely affected. They cannot grow much and it's affecting their food security and uh, livelihood opportunities. Thank you. And these are the references. Thank you very much, uh, Feroz, for a very interesting presentation too. Um, uh, again, uh, I am referring to the chat. Uh, already questions are kind of coming up there. Um, I'm now still looking at, yeah, I'm getting the speakers back in my screen. So, then we can move to the <coughs> questions. Um, I think we can start uh, with the question of Mike. Mike, do you like to come in uh, to ask your question? Yes, uh, hello, thank you very much. Thank you for two great presentations, very enjoyable. Uh, my question to thank you, Diem, is uh, in the chat, but <clears throat> the reason for asking is that Mangrove forests, mangrove ecosystems provide a natural uh, nursery area for both freshwater and marine fish species. And as such, they do provide not only a natural barrier to storm surges and cyclones, typhoons, but also this added value of providing um, a nursery area for young fish. And, and both fin fish and shellfish. So they, they can be a highly valuable resource which could be managed. So my question is, is there or do you think it would be sensible to have a set aside scheme whereby land is given back to nature so that mangrove takes over and provides some of these ecosystem services? Thank you, over. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Mike, for a very interesting questions. Uh, so uh, this is actually the investigate of the 
natural based solutions like for the um, saline intrusions like uh, adaptation plan also is was also paying a lot of attention of research in the Mekong Delta also. So um, as uh, my experience, I do know that we have a lot of projects for the mangrove uh, forest restoration in the Mekong Delta also, where we select the location to like uh, planting, regrow the mangrove forest along the coastal line, especially like in the in the east sea. So because like actually in the east sea, it's facing a lot with the erosion also. So we are try having a lot of uh, project also to uh, to pre planting the mangrove forest also. And as my understanding, in some periods location, the area of mangrove forest also increasing. Like in very brief time, it's really like decreasing. But in recent time, like there are some area is increasing also. But still the questions where since we choose to nurturing the mangrove forest, still our researcher is doing on that. And we have a kind of a different pack backer, like GIZ also working with us and different like angel project also coming to work to like for the size selections to assure like ecosystem service in the macro forest area also. Yeah, thank you for a very like interesting question and it's like very like uh, like it's was consideration is also very like highlight in our areas also. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yes. <laughs> OK, so now we may mm -hmm. kind of move to yeah. a second question. There yeah. is a second question of uh, Monoranjan. Monoranjan, would you like to come in and ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you. You can listen to me? Yes. OK, yeah. and, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, my, my question is that uh, in most of the uh, big Mekong Delta in the Vietnam, you showed that the intensification occurs from uh, one to two, two to three crops like that. But in some places, from 2011 to 2022 20, uh, or 20, you showed that the double, triple crop area reduced to double crop area. May I know the reason for this? Why farmers mm -hmm. go back to double crop area? Yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, for your nice know, questions. Uh, so, um, as in the horns period, there are a lot of changing from double rye right rub into triple rye right rub in very upper um, upstream uh, regions. But in the South Trang province, in the along the coastal line, in the second regions, uh, sub regions, we have also the changing from. Uh, triple dry wrap to the double dry wrap and so. So uh, that's partly of change in, um, in the period of 2011 to 2020 uh, is partly on by the uh, CS math evaluation is like report by the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. So um, actually it was done by IRI in the river time also. They do the CS map to see what is the grid and what is the adaptations also. In partly of that, um, the main of reason like um, the triple dry rub is was convert to double dry rub. It's rotations with one uh, like annual crop. It's like the watermelons or the other like annual crop in the third season is more effective in term, in term of the economic. Uh, because like in the third season, um, uh, dry season in Mekong data is not very high like um, effectively in term of production. So the people they they turn to change to the other annual crop season so it make more profits for a farmer so that is like main reasons yeah in the vietnamese okay. mekong delta yep okay thank you very much yeah <laughs> yeah thank uh, you uh, yes please. yeah, uh, uh -huh. and, yeah okay yeah does it mean that uh intensification happen but you know, uh, due to diversification, uh, you know, uh, from three to two, that means rice cropping number reduced, but overall the intensification increase. Is that right? 
like hard season probably now is being used for watermelon or for other crops. So meaning that you have three crops, but probably one crop is not rice, it's another kinds of crops. Is that right? Yeah, in um, actually in some areas, they, the third uh, crop season is a half convert to the other uh, annual crop. But actually in the reality, there are some um, areas, our government, our census like encourage to sometimes it's just leave for the for the third crop is just uh, let the land like recover or like it's not kind of on way happen to convert to the other crop. Some areas is just convert to double crop, but some areas like they convert to double crop and one rotation with one um, annual crop. Yeah, it's happened to a different weight in South Chang province. Yeah. I, I do not know that uh, uh, both yeah. the presenters for Firoz and you. <laughs> the, do you have any 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 study in that saline? You know, where the salinity is increasing, like salinity increasing crop loss. We are sometimes considering rice production is reduced, other crop production is reduced. But uh, you show in your uh, presentation that aquaculture production is increasing. Probably, it is shrimp production is increasing. So. Uh, in terms of production loss, one calculation, but income gain, is there any figure that, you know, uh, the uh, farmers or the, you know, farmers, uh, do they have uh, uh, income gain from the salinity intrusion? Because if we consider the case in Bangladesh, in some cases, crop production reduced, but aquaculture is a new intervention, shrimp, they are growing shrimp. So overall income has been increased. So. Uh, what's actually your observation from that salinity uh, prone areas? Yeah, should I respond? Yeah, so uh, in my observation, you're right. This, uh, in some of the southern boulders in Bangladesh, uh, the shrimp culture is growing. But uh, in, in most of the cases, shrimp cultures are uh, being done by large farmers. So the, the land is being lent by the farmers uh, to do uh, saline shim culture, which affects the salinity intrusion in the end, like in some of the polders over the years, they couldn't grow anything anymore because shim had like uh, viruses as well. But the issue, uh, what we also saw in some of these reports recently uh, conducted by Water Development Board as well, is that like uh, these shim cultures require less uh, labor intensive work than like the uh, farm culture, then the people, landless people, they don't have enough to sustain and then they migrate to somewhere else. Uh, so uh, there was a study uh, published uh, in one of the scientific journals which compared two polders, one which didn't do stream culture at all, uh, didn't let the saline water in, polder 21, and polder 22, which did only the saline uh, stream culture. So in the end, uh, after 10, 15 years of shrimp culture, that polder couldn't grow anything anymore. But the polder which didn't let the water in is still green and uh, growing uh, like uh, uh, crops. Uh, but it's just two polders, so uh, I'm not I'm not sure whether this has been done across the coastal region. But uh, yeah, there are some studies. Okay, thank you for your answer. I see a hand of Manaranjan. Is your hand related to this point, Manaranjan? Yes. Uh, Please go ahead. I think, I think Firoz, uh, you mentioned the uh, polder 22. Yeah, that was a stream called stream across uh, the whole polder stream farming was there. And there are some uh, killing also happened uh, to not to grow stream mm, so by the by the stream gear owners. But, now the, the the that area we are conducting the research in the in polder 22 it is green uh, th two crops the main crop is rice or it's season definitely and the second crop is the watermelon we are trying to introduce uh, the uh, other crops like maize sunflower but farmers are very much accustomed to grow uh, uh, watermelon in the <clears throat> if you see the uh, water crop suitability map or land suitability we have a that BARC developed, Bangladesh Inkas Research Council, that the, the that polder entirely uh, red red zone for dry season cropping. But people are cropping, 100% area are under uh, crop cultivation now in dry season. 
Uh, okay, thank you for your, to know for your thank you for your addition on this matter. I think that's very relevant. We didn't give uh, DM the opportunity to respond to the question. Would you also like to respond to the question? Yeah, I think it's just uh, respond. Uh, I'm just respond in terms of like the case study in Vietnam in Mekong data. Uh, actually, um, we we say that it's like uh, uh, because of the saline induction happen, so they have to convert from like rice wrap, double rice wrap to uh, rice cream. But at, in in the reality, the income of the this farming model rice rotation with cream is much higher than compared to rice cultivations only. This like in the reality in the Mekong Delta, and in some areas, some like people they the farmer they are like converting themselves or they do not need to wait the the Vietnamese government to or scientists to like encourage them or to push them themselves they have their own ways for the adaptation they converse yeah and even and, though and, like and then sorry to interrupt you but then they yeah. convert to rice plus shrimp yeah uh, in okay. some areas, they, they double dry rub, they convert to rice cream, and some are areas they convert from rice cream to cream only, like intensive cream. Yeah. So, but like because of the income, it's that higher as income. So, yeah. Yes. Thank you very yes. much. Very relevant yes. point to bring up. Um, yes. <laughs> I also saw the question. There is a particular question from Alice Laborte for uh, about the presentation of Feroz, I think. Uh, Alice, would you like to come in and ask your question? Um, hi, I just want to ask um, because sometimes in saline prone areas, uh, in saline uh, prone areas, sometimes they are affected uh, only in certain months of the year. Did you look into the seasonality? Because sometimes if it, you know, during the monsoon season with a lot of rain, then it's no longer an issue. OK, and uh, Alice, am I correct that your question was particular to Feroz or you also Feroz. wanted to ask the question? OK, Feroz, yes, please, Feroz, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, this is a data driven study. So we have done where data was available. Uh, so we didn't have like uh, seasonality data. Uh, for the whole globe, but when we'll be uh, focusing on uh, a specific region, uh, such as like uh, Bangladesh Delta or Mekong Delta, if we if the data is available, we will like to go more in detail in seasonality as well. And I agree that uh, salinity varies seasonally as well. So the data we have used are mostly like uh, decadal average of per year. So yeah, that's the what we had available at the time. And please, uh, it's also a request to everyone here. If you know like a beta data set that can help us in this uh, research, that will be extremely helpful for us to let, let us know. That is making good use of, of the opportunity to ask feedback. Uh, thank you for doing that. That's uh, indeed what, what we, why we are organizing this kind of sessions, right? That uh, is not only to show what you have, but also to ask your question, what others could help you with. Thank you for bringing that forward. We have a hand up from James. James, would you like to come in and ask your question? Hi, uh, yes. So I think my, my question is mostly directed towards the M. Um, sorry, um, which is I think the point you raised a second ago around the fact that uh, salinity is actually causing farmers to switch to away from rice and towards rice shrimp or just a shrimp and that's actually increasing their income and I think that slightly switches the narrative around the impacts of saline intrusion in the Mekong Delta, which is generally viewed as having a negative impact. And obviously it can if it's not very well controlled and if it gets into uh, farmers rice fields, but you know, effective infrastructure can support that. Um, and as we're seeing these shifts take place already with government support or and in areas where there isn't government support yet, but farmers are deciding to do it, what are the risks that you see and what risk do we need to be monitoring in terms of this widespread adoption or transition towards rice shrimp and, and, and what kind of research areas do you think emerge out of these new set of risks that might emerge from this transition? Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, your questions, Shem. Uh, so um, 
in the really taste some kind of uh, risk, like when we convert in the starlight inducing zones, we convert like from double right rub to right stream and even the right uh, stream to the aquaculture. So um, in in this moment, like when we do the field survey or we talk with the local, like the local people, like um, in there, like kind of uh, the the things happen like for very like what first one or two year they they have converting to the stream. It's very like good productions of stream, but if they may like continuously long term, it may lead to like uh, lower production like. The, the productions may be reduced if the continuously like cut, cultivate the stream. That is one thing that we have upstairs. And also like the environment issue is also like um, cause like results from the aquaculture like uh, cut like cultivation farming model and so because during the stream uh, the aquaculture uh, cultivation they have a lot of like um, like kind of uh, output from the aquaculture is lead to environment issue in that area. So that's a two main point that I, I was like sees until now, but maybe it's a number of more still. Uh, I think, yeah, need to be considered in like for the future or long term. If we go in with that uh, farming model, we need to consider. Yeah. And maybe just a follow up. Do we yep. know why uh, the aquaculture production does start to fall after a couple of years? Is it through sort of contamination of the area where they're producing? Um, yeah, is there any more insights into why that's the case? Yeah, I think for uh, the detail like, uh, of that, I, I think I need to like do the more review to have the like the to address very specific. But I think like the contamination and also the um, the soil quality, like it's also affecting if we are continually uh, like cut like doing the 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 aquaculture farming system in long term. So the soil also like. Um, the soil quality also is will be affected by by this, yeah. So and uh, I have also one observe like uh, this. This is a feedback from the farmer. They says that uh, for example, if they are doing the aquaculture farming model in one or two like year, and then they return with the uh, dry stream, so it's more effectively for the falling like higher production for the falling aquaculture. But if they keep continuously three or four years of aquaculture and then the production is like reducing. So that is also the feedback from uh, the farmer during few survey that I, I got. Yeah, so I think a lot of like, yeah. A lot of things for our scientists to do <laughs> in this area to see what uh, will be the like the sustainable farming model for for these uh, reasons. Yep. Yes, we also yeah. got in the chat uh, an, an answer by Mike. Mike, would you like to um, share what you are uh, putting there? Because I'm not sure if everybody sees the chat. OK, yes, what I was saying is in relation to James's question and the reply from Diem, uh, which is quite right, that the, the, sh the shrimp production drops off. Typically, this is because of a toxic buildup of sludge. Wow. And if it's not handled properly, which can be quite expensive, then it stresses the next crop of shrimp. Uh, they're more susceptible to disease and the production drops off. Uh, under ideal circumstances, the toxic sludge may be placed on the rice plinth and washed by the first monsoon rains to reduce the toxicity and uh, lower the salinity. And that is what happens during seasonal shrimp rice production. In other words, the fertility, the organic matter from the sludge is used but the, the, the toxic anoxic part of the sludge is mitigated by, by the rain. But of course, that is labor intensive and uh, expensive. So as, as a production system, 
it often moves into this boom bust scenarios where production tails off. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification and uh, giving that additional information. Uh, with an eye on the time, I uh, need to stop you for asking more questions. Um, but that brings me that we do have a platform for after presentation talks uh, and uh, exchange. Uh, I'm linking to uh, Jahan for coming in with the uh, with the overview of the um, uh, the talks for the rest of the year. Jahan. Uh, yeah, uh, I will invite Aysen because uh, who is compiling uh, uh, this, uh, you know, lineup for the whole next uh, this year. So Aysen, are you there? Aysen is always yeah. there. What would I'm we there. do without Aysen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Aysen, please continue. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we already have the lineup for 2024, but there's still like some open uh, uh, spots for other members to share. But this is the initial list. For February, we have the Delta Talks Live during the AMD annual meeting in Dhaka. And then for March, we have the inclusive water governance in Bangladesh. For April, we have the salinity and livestock in the deltas. For May, it's open. Most likely, uh, our colleagues working on DCAS will present on this. And then for June, we have the food safety in the deltas. For July, so this is close to my heart, uh, we will have a talk on science and communication. For August, we have managing data on salinity, the experiences in salad program. And then for September, it's open. So anyone in the group who is interested, just send us a message. And then for October, we have the water and food systems in the deltas. And for November and December, still open. And then, we posted this in the comment section. So we have the Delta after talks. We post there like a question related to our discussion today and everyone is invited to make a comment or add some, some insights regarding this conversation. So this is uh, co-presented by our partner from the Netherlands Food Partnership. So you can visit their site. And then we will send you the full announcement soon through our newsletter and um, also to our website. We will also put the links to our uh, previous Delta Talks from last year. And uh, thank you so much for attending every time we send this invitation. Sorry for spamming, but we just want you to, uh, we, we want to um, have more attendance in, in the succeeding Delta Talks. Again, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Aysen, for this very concise um, bust of information passing by. Uh, if people want to, a list and uh, uh, a topic for um, a still open time slot, feel free to mail to Eisen. Um, uh, already in the chat, I see that uh, the climate action uh, in AMD work package three uh, could present possibly in May. That would be very interesting. So that will be followed up uh, in between people. And also thank you for uh, uh, bringing up that we like to invite more people. So in case you want to invite other colleagues, feel free to share uh, the invite, um, as well as you may also refer people to just drop a mail to Eisen because he's always very prompt in then putting people on the list. So it's not only for one time, but they can also be on the list for the other uh, sessions. Uh, of course, very excited that the uh, Delta Talks will be live in Dhaka. I do not know how many people on this call will be there, but that will be, of course, a very interesting opportunity. Uh, Feroz and I hope to be there as well uh, from our side, so we are very uh, excited about that. Um, and uh, also good to note the Netherlands Food Partnership, uh, the, the, the uh, link to the kind of after party. <laughs> uh, uh, it's also in the chat, the link, so you can kind of easily click to it and see, uh, post your questions, uh, uh, kind of, uh, I don't know exactly how it will work, but uh, let's try it and let's come back to it in our next session. Um, that's all from my side at this moment. I'm handing to Jahan for 
Uh, finally, concluding nicely within the time of your all busy schedules. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, uh, you know when, when actually uh, Ison was presenting, I found that some of the spots are open. Actually, when I saw it in the last night, because work package two members are discussing among you know ourselves for two or three presentations. So already I booked you know some of this open spot from uh, May, uh, September, probably, you know, if some can conflict with like work package three also wants to present in May, so we can actually uh, discuss and uh, fix the schedule. So that's not a problem, but it's it's good that almost everything is already booked you know, for this year. So uh, thank you all for this very informative presentations. Uh, thank you to presenters. And we are looking forward to apply this knowledge uh, in AMD and also in the next business cycle that we are thinking about. So thank you all. Have a nice day and night to everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Yes.